So, in this video I'm going to be talking about how to tune these servo motors with these Chinese servo drives. So, stick around! So, before I go into the details and the specifics of the solution, I'm going to be talking about the problem. I'm going to be talking about maybe some of the ways that I thought about solving the actual problem and then the solution that I settled with. So what I've got in front of me is my spindle assembly. So this over here actually sits on my CNC machine and the idea is inside this big cast aluminium or cast iron block there is a BT30 spindle cartridge and then over here a big cylinder, big chunky cylinder sits which is actually over here. So this over here sits there and then that, that enables me to operate my automatic tool changer. And then I've got a servo motor, which is a 1.8 kilowatt servo motor, and then it's geared up to my actual cartridge. So the cartridge itself is rated to 12,000 RPM, the servo motor 3,000 RPM, and then there is um, it's a 56 to 18 gear reduction in terms of gear ratio going on here. So it gives me a total maximum speed of around 9,300 RPM. So the problem is that there's a lot of reflected inertia here. I'm gonna be speaking about that in a bit, but before I go into that, if you haven't already, this is a part three in a series on the servo motors, and part one contains a lot of the math that actually is quite helpful to understanding the problem at hand. So if you haven't watched that, maybe go and watch that first. Um, if none of the stuff that I speak about in this video really makes sense, then maybe going back and watching that video, maybe make things a little bit clearer. So I'm going to have a video out on this at one point on how I put it together and machining up all the various components. This is actually cast in my backyard. This over here is machined on my actual CNC and then all the parts and everything are designed in house effectively. So um, let me demonstrate the problem and let's talk about the solution. So I've got this set up at the moment and um, essentially the servo is off. So um, if I show you something quickly, if I go ahead and try to maybe move on the actual spindle side, you can probably see that the belt wants to make its way back. And um, there's a little bit of elasticity in the, surf in the actual system. Um, and this is to do with, you know, the stiffness in the actual stiffness in the system, which is something that I speak about in my first video. So I'm going to go ahead and enable my servo drive. So at the moment, the motor is enabled. And I'm going to give it a step input, but on the spindle side. So I'm just going to, you know, give it a step input and see how the servo reacts to it. So here I go. And you can see the motor completely goes on one. And the reason why is it's overcompensating, but it's actually mainly due to an inertia mismatch. So um, some of the stuff I speak about in my first video, I give you a tool set. And what I've done here is I've ignored all those equations and I've gone ahead and sized the servo motor in an application where which it has a high inertia ratio. So it can't be used straight out of the box. It has to be tuned. I'm gonna talk about that now. So let's go into the specifics of some of the reasons why this motor in this application is doing that. So very briefly, I have a belt in my system. So number one problem is stiffness. And I really want to apologize for the lighting conditions. There's a lot of sun glaring through, but hopefully you can see what I'm writing anyway. So stiffness is one. So I speak about that in my first video and because I'm using a belt, I have inherently not a lot of stiffness. I am, um, you know, belts in a server application, I think typically are not recommended and the problem that I highlighted really does, you know, demonstrate that. Another thing is reflected inertia. So um, to actually, I speak about this a lot in my first video, if you actually want to size up these motors correctly, you need to consider the inertia of the motor and the armature in there and what the actual motor or the inertia on everything else on the other side is. So if you have like a geared application, you can essentially write down your reflected inertia like this. So and all of that is over I squared. And obviously none of this makes any sense, but I can explain it. So the JD or the inertia is down to the drive system, which in my instance would be the 
the actual um, motor, the motor itself. Um, and then over here, this over here is the external load. So that there is my actual cartridge and maybe the tools I put on the spindle. So that there is like the load. And then that there is the coupling. So like the belt and everything in between the drive and the actual spindle cartridge. And then over here, this is the actual gearbox ratio. So, and then this over here is basically the inertia of the gearbox itself. I've got a belt driven application where in which I'm actually reducing, I've got a reduction gearbox going on. So this term over here becomes 18 over 56, which is my gear ratio respectively. Um, 18 on the small side, the spindle side, and 56 on my actual servo side. And then this is all squared, which when you do the math, effectively what it comes up with is 0.103. So obviously this is on the denominator side of things. So it basically does this and times it by 10. So um, you can now see that your actual, you know, inertia on your load side is, well, because of this term, is a lot more bigger than just simply the gear ratio which is 18 over 56 and then when you you know compare and look at your inertia ratio you know your actual load side versus your actual drive side the stuff i spoke about before then because of this term over here uh, the problem is much bigger than what you initially expect it to be and that's the reason why the servo motor is struggling it's got a very it's not a very stiff system and there's a high reflected inertia and um, to solve these problems, we need to go into the drive and we need to configure the drive. So we're actually, you know, changing some of the parameters such as, you know, the feed forward gain and, you know, the actual stiffness gain and, you know, the, the gain parameters that are associated with, you know, controlling those loops, those feedback loops. So to actually tune our servo drives, we need to look at what it's doing. And for that, I need to look at the encoder values of the actual servo motor and then also probe the raw input signals to that servo motor. So I'm getting those signals and I'm feeding them to an oscilloscope. I did have a beautiful piece of footage showing how all of this works and then I deleted the footage. So you've got me talking over this video. So essentially in this video I'm soldering those connections and I'm soldering them between the motion controller and the actual opto couplers that separate it from the actual servo drive so the actual input to the oscilloscope is isolated and i'm doing the same for the actual input to the servo drives and then what i do is i store that on the oscilloscope and then it sends that data to python so over here i've got my python script um, i'm not going to go into the code specifically but essentially what it's doing is it's reading from the oscilloscope. So the oscilloscope goes ahead and acquires the signal from the servo drive. And then it, my, my script probes the scope, so it grabs that piece of data and then um, analyzes it. I've got a lot of work going on up here which basically writes some of the code or some of the raw values to an external file. And then I can also read those values as well and, and store them you know, for future use if I want to. But the cusp of the code, essentially what it does is it looks for the zero crossing point in the data. So the zero crossing point in the data and then it basically grabs the time equivalent. So whenever that zero crossing occurred. And then by knowing the time, um, it can basically work out the, the time difference between the pulses and infer the velocity, the acceleration and then and the position. So um, it's not much to the code, but um, it seems to work for me. Anyway, so if anyone wants maybe a copy of the code or I, know, I can put it on GitHub or I can email it across or whatever. So just maybe put a comment down below. Um, essentially, I've also got the code basically giving out the desired millimetre travel. So over here, the desired millimetre travel and the actual millimetre travel. So this over here, the desired millimetre travel is my pulse, my pulse input into the drive. And then my actual millimeter travel is essentially my encoder A and B values. So analyzing those, I can understand how far or how much did my servo turn and in turn, how much did it move my stage? So you can see that actual value over here is it's not far off. Um, 
we're off by you know, 35 microns over here, sorry, 35? 3.5 microns, it's actually, it's okay. Um, however, over time that might add up, I'm not sure, um, but I'm consistently getting very similar values. So another thing that this script outputs, which is really the key thing, is this graph. So this graph over here is um, essentially my desired output. So I think this is a green line, maybe, I'm not sure, I'm colorblind, but green to me. Um, this line over here is um, a trapezoid. So it inspires confidence in my code because the actual profile the actual software is sending the drive is a trapezoid. Um, essentially, you've got your acceleration over here, your constant velocity, and your deceleration. And then the blue line over here is my actual encoder value, so my uh, my actual response, so what the servo drive is actually doing. And you can see it. There is a sizable lag between my desired position and my actual actual velocity I should say. So um, I should probably explain the scales, uh, the x-axis is time, time in seconds, and the y-axis is meters per second, so it's basically speed, it's velocity. So, um, but yeah, I could, I could similarly plot acceleration and also position, but right now we're just looking at the velocity curves. So the name of the game is to improve this dynamic response, essentially get the blue curve looking more like the desired curve, the green curve. So. I should probably point out that the graphs I showed you just earlier and the values uh, are actually for my X stage, so not the servo drive system, spindle system that you saw at the beginning of this video. And the reason why I'm showing you those graphs is because I think it's more applicable to most people's scenarios um, and it's a lot easier for me to demonstrate the effect of tuning your drives using those graphs rather than the very erratic spindle system that I showed you initially. So. This, this manual that I've got in front of me is um, a drive manual that I found online. Um, essentially, it's from this place, and it's very applicable to my servo drives, although certainly not the manual that I got with my servo drives. But it more or less works, and the functions and the parameters outlined in this manual are very much applicable, and they very much work for the drive that I have. So you might find that it works for you too. And essentially on 192, I'll post uh, maybe a link down below in the description for this actual manual. But um, there's a section here on gain tuning. So in this manual, it tells you the parameters that you need to change to maybe improve or maybe decrease your, um, your dynamic response. So the first thing that you need to do is you need to go ahead and change your inertia ratio. So the inertia ratio of the drive. And... Um, I think actually before I go into this, I probably should say that I'm not going to go into the depth and the math behind, you know, servo tuning, and I'm certainly not going to go into the control loops and what's going on in the background. I'm going to give you more of a practical approach. Um, although, that being said, I do urge you to go on YouTube or find some videos out there that actually outline the background because it makes this stuff much more comprehensible. But the first thing that you need to do if you want to actually go ahead and tune your motors is to input your load inertia ratio. So this is PN257, which you can access through your front panel. And um, this is the value over here is dependent on your setup. So this is some of the equations that I went through in one of my other videos, which you can check out. And once you've worked out your load inertia ratio and input in that, you're basically telling the drive um, the load it expects to see. Anyway, so moving swiftly on from that, there's another section in here which essentially has automatic gain adjustment. It's a bit apprehensive when I had to go ahead and change some of the gain settings in the drive because um, you can essentially be there for a very long time and uh, you know, there's a few functions that you can change, although maybe not as many functions as more of an advanced drive. Um, nevertheless, you can spend a lot of time in this field. Um, but what they've done over here is they've given you a table and this table has essentially your like mechanical stiffness class, which is kind of nice because as you go up the ranks, um, it kind of gives you preset values for all the various gain settings in the drive and then improves your dynamic response accordingly. So you might find that you're getting quite a, your, your system is not very stiff. So, you know, you've got a belt system like the spindle I showed you. And in that instance, what I've done is actually reduced my mechanical class. But for the X stage, 
I want to actually make my desired position or my actual position very similar to my desired position. So I'm actually going to go up the mechanical class stiffness. That's what I'm going to do. So you want to go into PN259 and you want to imp increase some of these values. I would read through the manual. I think there was another setting that I had to change to access some of the automatic gain adjustment, but it's pretty easy to follow through. So if you go ahead and do that, uh, essentially, um, I've gone ahead and changed that and then we can see what that does to the graphs. So I've got a couple of graphs over here showing what the actual curves look like when I analyze the data uh, for the different levels in that chart I showed you. So essentially what I've done is I've desired a 10 mil travel and then I've looked at like how much travel I actually get. So the first graph on the left over here, that's essentially straight out of the box. That's what the servo motor does. And uh, you can see that the two curves, my desired in blue, doesn't, so my actual in blue, doesn't really match my desired position. Um, but moving on, when I had, went ahead and changed that value, so I think the default was maybe four on the drive, and I've gone ahead and changed that level to level seven. And um, you can see that they're much closer matched. I have also reduced my acceleration slightly, which, um, you know, it reduces some of the requirements for the drive to actually match that curve. So reducing your acceleration means it's got, well, it essentially has a bit longer to actually get to where it needs to be. Um, but yeah, you can see that's helped. And then going ahead, I increased it to eight, which is much closer matched. And then nine is more or less perfect. However, you can see that my actual desired and actual position starts off of being four microns, you know, out, and then it slowly increases. So, you know, over here on level eight, I'm, I'm six, and then over here on nine, I'm actually eight microns off. So I'm using a five mil pitch ball screw, and, um, you know, it, it's not much in the grand scheme of things, but the one thing I would say is when you're actually tuning your servo motors, um, there is, well, for me anyway, there is a desire to get it almost perfect, but whatever test you're doing and the stuff that I'm showing you is only a snippet of most of the testing I did, um, you've got to make sure that it's going to somewhat represent a real life condition. And in my case, using nine, although it looks really good, didn't work well for me because in certain applications, in certain moves, the actual motors would jitter and, um, it would essentially create an unstable response from the servo motor. So I actually backed off the motors to, to seven, um, but I, I changed the acceleration profiles. So the actual demanded acceleration I reduced. And um, that got me where I wanted to be in the end. So bear that in mind when you're actually tuning your motors. Another cool thing that I found was this graph at the end. So this graph on the end, you can see that the tail off on the actual encoder values starts to oscillate. Um, and I was wondering why that was there, but the reason why it's there is I changed the angular contact bearings on one of my stages. And that oscillation, oscillate, the, the, what you see there on the graph is actually the remnants of that. I, I set these up wrong, the angular contact bearings that were squealing slightly, and the encoder picked that up on the server motor, which I thought was pretty cool. I mean, um, if I was sophisticated enough, I can maybe set it up so, you know, it can analyze the motors and actually work out whether there's any wear in some of the components or if some of the components are actually not moving correctly. I don't know, maybe not enough oil lubrication or the ball screws are wearing out. So I thought that was pretty cool. But yeah, in essence, if you do want to tune your motors, this is a real neat way of doing it. Obviously, you do have to set up your oscilloscope. You do need to write some code. Um, but if you can do that, if you have access to doing that, then you can look at your response and you can get relatively okay results out of these motors if you're willing to put the time into it. So I uh, hopefully this video is useful. Um, apologies, it's a very long video, but um, I just wanted to share my knowledge and what I've actually done to actually maybe get the best out of your application because there's not a lot of information out there. So if you did like the video, if you found it useful, give it a thumbs up, maybe consider subscribing. Thank you.